Okay. Well, in some, I, I got this course because the guy normally teaches it as one sabbatical for it. Um, but that's sort of maybe, might be seen as a negative reason to cop a course. Uh, but you really couldn't ask for a better time as a non neoclassical economist to be talking about political economy. Because not only we had a financial crisis that the rest of the neoclassical said couldn't happen, uh, it's still going on. Nobody in this seems to notice in Australia, but it's still obviously happening globally. And the econ profession is now in a, in a fairly strong state of format and disarray. But it didn't start that way. If you go back to before the crisis began, you'll find comments like this from uh, Lucas when he was president of the American Economic Association. And the reason I emphasise this particular set of statements is just how triumphal they were before the crisis hit. They really thought there were going to be no problems at all in the macro economy anymore. They were in control, they knew how it worked, and they solved all the problems. So here's Lucas saying, a macro is born, there's a distinct field. Now notice the date, in the 1940s. Intriguing. I thought it started with, with Keynes in the 1930s, but 1940s. And he said, we, we hope we then get the knowledge to prevent the crisis occurring again. And here he's arguing before the assembled economists of the American Economic Association at the annual conference they hold each year in January, somewhere in America, saying we've succeeded. The central problem of preventing depressions has been solved for all practical purposes and been solved for many decades. Hi, number five. <laughs> take a chair, we'll, we'll introduce you after we take a break. Come, okay. All right. Well, that's, that's the guy. Somebody actually asked me in some of my previous web lectures to whack up some photographs to show who I'm talking about here. So I've got a few little illustrations. That's Lucas. And he wasn't the only one. This is Ben Bernanke saying that what's the low inflation that they're experiencing? This is up to about 2000, and I think he wrote this in 2004. And so the economy's improved in a whole range of ways of reproduction and volatility. And he was actually quite strong in calling what he called, emphasising the, the term the great moderation, what was happening from not, basically the 1990s recession forward. He said recessions are less frequent and milder, volatility has declined, and I love the final bit. The sources are controversial, but there's evidence that he has improved control of inflation, which of course is the responsibility of the, the board he was part of at the time, the uh, Federal Reserve has contributed an important measure to this welcome change in the economy. Everything really good. It's been looking nice and smug. And so the first person was the president of the American Economic Association. The second was, he wasn't at the time, but he of course became chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time he was on the board of the Federal Reserve. And here we have the ed first editor of the American Economic Review Macro. So for many, many decades, the American Economic Review had one journal which I think comes out about 12 times a year now, um, devoted to excluding non-neoclassical thought. But one journal wasn't enough for that, so they broke down the micro and macro, and I, I, th I think there's one actually on finance as well, but I'm not sure. This is the founding editor of the American Economic Review Macro, talking about the state of macroeconomic theory. So the actual you know, transition from ISLM to dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. And there's been enormous progress and substantial convergence. What he's talking about there, or what Paul Krugman is, well, he's not the only one to call it, but he calls them the salt worker versus the freshwater economists. And he's saying, facts get in the way, of eventually forcing relevant theory out. Which, from a non-neoclassical point of view, I wish that were true. And good theory is a way of forcing out bad theory. And what he saw happening was that the, the tools the new classicals developed, which are the real business cycle models, came from Kidlin and Prescott, and they're the ones we in general call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Those tools dominated, but they were modified by the facts the new Keynesians brought in, which are where they bring in imperfection. So rather than perfect competition, you have imperfect competition. Rather than no unions, you have unions, etc., etc. Rather than instantaneous responses, you have adaptive responses, etc., etc. He said a largely common vision has emerged. The state of macro is good. Now, I love the fact, I should actually put the exact date inside there. Blanchard first posted a paper on the, one of the several uh, websites which you can put working papers and economics up on August the 13th, 2008. And the crisis we're now in, was dated by most people from August the 7th, 2007. One year, I don't know what he's doing in the meantime. 
one year earlier, which were when the Bank National of Peru shut down three of its funds that were exposed to the subprime market in America, one year and six days before he published this paper. And that's Blanchard, also looking quite definitive. Now, then we had this little thing called the Great Recession. And just to give you an idea of the type of economic data that they're looking at, this is a smoothed trends in unemployment and inflation between 1980 and 2000 and 2012, and as you look 2008 there, and as you can see, you can see there's been a high level of inflation, 15%, coming down to 2.5%, unemployment hitting 10% during the 85 crisis, which was worse for America than Australia. Our worst recession was the 1990s, their worst was the uh, mid-80s one. Uh, then, you know, still a high level of unemployment during the the recession before Clinton got to power, lower unemployment again during the recession they had in um, the uh, early 2000s, which Australia only had one negative quarter again, managed to avoid that one. So that was a great moderation. And then something strange happened on the way to perfection, what they're now calling the Great Contraction, that's quoting Rogoff, which I think is a more effective term than the Great uh, Recession. Suddenly an explosion in unemployment and a collapse in inflation. So you went from unemployment being down about the 5% mark to hitting up towards 10. And inflation, which was running about 2.5%, becoming minus 2% ultimately. And what I've added there as well, the black line, is the one there classical still ignore, which is the level of private debt compared to GDP, which I'm grabbing on the right-hand side. That's the one that meant people like myself said this crisis is going to happen because uh, economists who take that seriously, non-neoclassical economists, particularly Wynne Godley, but also Michael Hudson and Peter Fors, uh, uh, Dirk Bessemer, went through a list of about a dozen people he found. There's about 90 or so that the uh, Real World Economics Review said identified that as a causal factor in the crisis they expected to have happened. Neoclassical, of course, didn't look at it at all. Uh, but that's, that's the, the whammy that hit them that they thought from nowhere. There's been a pursuit recovery of sorts since. So inflation, unemployment has fallen a bit, inflation has risen a bit, but it's still the longest recession in post-war history for America, and certainly the deepest level of persistent unemployment. And what about after the crisis? Well, now rather than being triumphalist, or saying, oh dear, there's something wrong with our models, this is the sort of stuff they're now coming out. And the sergeant, of course, won the Nobel Prize for economics last year, and he was interviewed uh, by, I think, the Minneapolis Fed Journal just before having it awarded. And his argument was, well, the models we used, would, they, they were designed for the good times, not the bad times. A bit like saying, we've designed cars for straight roads, not ones with bends in them. You can't blame us for the fact we hit the road, hit the, hit the wall when we go around a corner. We designed these cars for straight roads. And here's Ben Bernanke saying, our standard model's flawed. Now you think after, after the predictions they made prior to the crisis, and the crisis itself, there might at least be some admission that maybe something is wrong with the models. Now you reckon the models are fine, and much the same reason as given by Sargent here. I wonder whether a bit of collusion went on here in their excuses about why they didn't see the crisis coming. Most of the time, including during recessions, serious instability, financial stability, not an issue. The standard models are designed for these non-crisis periods. Now I didn't see any caveats to that effect before the crisis. They didn't say, warning, do not use this model during a crisis. They said, warning, no more crises are going to happen. That's what they were saying. And here's Blanchard, having championed DSG models, the new Keynesian models, uh, looking back and saying, it's obvious we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And here are three more appropriate photographs of what they look like these days. And Anki seems to be praying, and uh, Oliver's scratching his head rather badly. So uh, I think. Life has not quite worked out how they thought it was going to do. So they're evasive. Now when you see them attempting to actually model the crisis, the only attempts that I've seen so far are by Ireland on one hand and McKibben on the other. There must be other papers out by now. And their ex explanation for the crisis is almost permanently negative random exogenous shocks with a mean of zero. Now, I don't know how you can permanently stay negative on that base, but this is the sort of argument you get. Ireland says, well, the crisis began in late 2007 with a series of adverse preference and technology shocks, and those are the only things which can give you a negative outcome in a new Keynesian DSG model. Uh, and they're roughly the same as previous crises, 
But then they got bigger and deeper and went on longer. So they're now explaining the crisis by bigger shocks that get bigger and remain negative. And that's a quote from Ireland. McKibben's not much better. He is a bit better, but still the same basic. At least in this case, Ireland didn't even identify where the shocks came from. McKibben and Stockwell did attempt to say, well, it's a shock from the financial system, a shock from the housing market, uh, at least saying where they came from. But of course, it does sound strange to be told that the housing market and the finance markets are exogenous to the economy. I would have thought they were part of it. So, very, very strange. So, how on earth did we get macro to be in this state? How on earth did we get to be so wrong about the economy and so defensive about it? And I think we have to start slightly early. I'm going to go back to, not a blank screen, ah, the physio, thank you. Because we really have to see where macro came from historically. Don't just look at the, the last 10 or 20 years ago, right back and see where did macro theory come from. In my opinion, the first macroeconomists or the first true economists were the physiocrats with Francois Canet, this guy. He was a, literally he was a physician for the French uh, court. He was a physician at the time that autopsies were first being performed. You open up the human body, you see tubes, etc., etc., reservoirs apparently. And then the argument was that this a whole flow system of the body, and that became the analogy he used for the economy itself. And if you look at the tableau economique, which was his attempt to model how the economy could generate greater surplus for the king in many ways, it had a circular flow concept to it. Uh, there was production of a surplus and distribution of that surplus. There were wonky theories about where the surplus actually came from, but there were theories about production of a surplus and how it's distributed. And there was a multiplier effect from changing in investment. If you could actually make a slight change to productivity, you get a dramatic increase in the level of the surplus. So there were, to me, true macroeconomic elements to it. And it's also um, arguable that he had concepts of unemployment in there as well, because Kinney talked about how the, the king's desire was to have as large a retinue as possible. To support the retinue, you had to have agricultural productivity. He was arguing for a change in the nature of tax collection from the French peasants to improve the level of productivity and bringing in some technological advances as well. And out of that, you'd then be able to employ more uh, retinue for the king. So people would be unemployed artisans would become employed artisans. So there's a concept of unemployment there as well. Now, I think Smith took us a huge leap backwards because macroeconomic concepts really almost disappeared from Adam Smith. There is no discussion for the potential for unemployment and so on. It's down to the micro level arguments which have dominated uh, economics ever since. And there's a belief that the market cannot suffer from a permanent glut. And I think we've still got this belief in neoclassical economics today. Now, a lot of people know the invisible hand comment. In fact, there's apparently two times Smith used the comment. One in the theory of uh, moral sentiments that I haven't read. One of my confessions there, I've got to catch up on that one day. Um, so he used the invisible hand there. He used it second time in The Wealth of Nations. And his argument there was to say that people who were saying that if you opened up trade or reduced trade barriers with Europe, there wouldn't be an emigration of English produ producers to cheaper wage countries across the channel in England. Instead, the invisible hand would actually just make them decide to stay in England. Strangely enough, it wasn't solely about the idea of reaching a, a socially beneficial outcome in terms of market distribution. It was actually about whether production would go offshore. And he's saying it wouldn't do so. So a strange comment. But nonetheless, that belief that there was the, the invisible hand the way we've got used to it is a, a form of coordination occurring and reaching a socially beneficial outcome despite people's attempts to use the market for their own advantage. That became ingrained in economics from that time on. And <coughs> Ricardo had a macro framework. You could have used Ricardo for macro reasoning, and certainly Schrapper showed a lot of that in the way he re reintroduced the world of Ricardo's works as he did the editing, the complete works of Ricardo. So there's Ricardo. So he could have got macro out of Ricardo, but the weird thing was, he actually followed this guy, Jean-Baptiste Say. And he accepted Say's argument that there could be no general glut. 
Now, the reason I say it's bizarre that he did, because Ricardo clearly belonged to the classical school of economic thought. And in the classical school of thought, you really, the, the, the idea of value comes down to the effort involved in producing something. Their concept of value is a non-subjective concept of value. Whereas Jean-Baptiste Say is a precursor of neoclassicals to whom value means utility. And it's quite amazing that somebody who had an objective theory of value, which is what Ricardo had a later, a later measure of value, not as much a later theory, but a later measure of value, and argued that value is in a sense an objective thing, actually used for macro reasons, he accepted the arguments of Jean-Baptiste Say, which is entirely based on a, <coughs> on a utility theory. So just take you through that quickly. Ricardo carried on Smith's arguments that value reflects the effort involved in production, not the utility of the final object being produced. And here's a little quote about it, which he, where he's, he starts the principles from this point of view. And so this is the most important point of political economy. Everything rises or falls in value in proportion to the facility or difficulty of producing it. And I emphasize that it's actually an effort theory of value rather than a labor theory of value because, as you can see, he starts from that point. He said the effort of producing something is what determines the thing's value, not the utility of that thing to the final consumer. So utility he saw as a prerequisite for exchange, something which he worked on, which had effort to produce, had to then have utility to the final consumer for it to actually be sold. But the utility didn't set its price. And here's, again, a very emphatic statement of that. Utility is not the measure of exchangeable value, though it's absolutely essential to it. So you can't sell something which is useless to the end consumer, but the value, the price that's put upon it, reflects the effort that goes into its manufacturing, not the subjective utility of the consumer. So, you know, the caveat that if it wasn't useful, you couldn't sell it. But it's an effort-based theory of value. And when he talked about what utility variations in, in subjective utility might do, he'd allow a temporary fluctuation around the price level, but ultimately the price would return to the reflect the relative effort involved in producing different objects. So the computer took twice as much effort to make as the leather handbag, then the computer would sell for twice as much as the leather handbag. Okay. And it was really that long-term sense of value. Now that's very, very non-neoclassical. Okay. But here's Say. And the reason that Ricardo said there couldn't be a, a general glut was accepting micro-arguments from Jean-Baptiste Say, who you could grab out of any first-year textbook. And he says, Mr. Shea has shown, most of the factory shown, that there's no amount of capital which may not be employed because demand is only limited by production. So a supply flight argument that says supply determines demand, effectively, which is very much the neoclassical mindset. And he says, no man produces but with a view to consume or sell. And he never sell but with the intention to buy something else which will be useful. So the only reason you go to produce is to say to sell, the only reason you sell is to buy. And therefore, by being a producer, you become a consumer. And therefore, your individual demands are balanced. And since your demands are balanced, everybody else's demands are balanced, the overall system is balanced. And it's a supply-led vision. Supply in this vision has to precede demand. You can't demand something unless you supply something beforehand and sell it. I'm going to come back to emphasise that quite a bit when I go on to the uh, circuit, circuit theory later on. Um, so, and this is now say, saying productions are always bought by productions. Money is just a medium, so money is irrelevant. Okay? Forget about money. Again, this is, I, think you, I hope you can see the extent to which this is familiar territory for how you were taught macro 150 years later. Okay? So it's actually more than that. So too much of a commodity we can produce, so it will be a part of the individual product. But that can't be the respect to all. So if there's... Um, too much corn, there'll be too little with something else. Have a look at the whole phrase. So you can have individual gluts, individual shortages, but you cannot have an aggregate glut or an aggregate shortage. 
In fact, that, was, that may have been Ricardo. I better check that again carefully. I've got Say coming up in detail in a moment. This is Say writing back in 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, Guess what he called the catechism of political economy you can easily find online. And he's saying, from his catechism, he's, he has a series of questions which he provides the answers for. And one of the questions is, how do you give value? And he says, you give it utility. So it's not the effort you put into making something now, it's whatever you do that gives something utility to another purchaser. And it's subjective. He says, you can't, uh, whatever proof satisfies the desires of the consumer, is what have utility. You can't objectively define utility. Now, to give you an idea of the contrast to the classical school, in a sense, if Marx was asked what's the utility of a chair, his answer would be you can sit in it. If you asked John Baptiste Say, he said, how comfortable the chair makes you feel. Okay? It's that orientation between visions of utility. And therefore, if you had a crisis, you could have crises. Say didn't say. Say doesn't say it, it sounds weird when you, to, when you have to say that. But Say did not say that you couldn't have crises. He said there'd be disproportionality. They couldn't be an equal general glut. So if there's excess supply in one market, there could be excess demand in others. And of course, that could be an excess supply of labour. Okay? Therefore, you could have an unemployment. But it would be because there's an excess demand for commodities elsewhere. And all you have to do is drop the price of labour and everything would be perfect. So, general gluts and general slumps were impossible. And the argument goes this way. Money's just an intermediary. You don't actually want money. Nobody actually needs money or tries to get hold of it. You only sell to buy again because you're trying to increase your utility. Um, so each individual has matched the supply and demand. And therefore the sum of all excess supplies has to be zero. So you can have a slump. Uh, and that can be of course caused by government regulations or monopolies or trade unions, all those nasty sort of interventions into the market system. But if you let them get rid of that intervention and let the price of whatever's being um, uh, held too high fall, demand will rise, you'll get back to equilibrium again. So it's a micro-logic, okay? It's applying supply and demand type thinking, like you've copped in micro cells, to go from a hypothesis about how each individual behaves to reach an aggregate of the macro, to say the macro itself can't have flaws because micro is perfect. And if you have any flaws at the aggregate level, it's because there's something wrong with the micro level. Something restricting supply in a particular market or holding prices too high. Get rid of that and the macro economy back into balance again. And it's a real argument, a non-monetary. The argument throughout is that money doesn't matter. And here's the classic statement of it by say, in the catechism, that every producer asks for money in exchange for his products, and read this very carefully, only for the purpose of employing that money again immediately in the purchase of another product. For we don't consume money, and it is not sought after in ordinary cases to conceal it. Did any of that sound realistic to you, or garbage? I think you don't need money, <laughs> okay, fair enough. But people certainly do conceal how much they've got, do want to accumulate it. So there's obviously unrealistic elements that to begin with. But he says, with that starting point, says producers, though they have the air of the demanding money for their money, do in reality demand merchandise for their merchandise. So nobody's trying to accumulate money in the system. How anybody could fall for that is beyond me, but nonetheless. So what you go from is a micro balance for each consumer stroke producer, because everybody is both. If you're a consumer, you can only be a consumer if you are a producer. So it's a match role. And that balance at each individual level, because you're simply trying to sell and get back the same value in different form, means the macro economy is also balanced. So you can have oversupply in some, undersupply in others, let the price system work, and everything will come to equilibrium, and everything will be fully employed, all markets will be balanced. So, if you want to see a very cogent argument as to why that's just completely bollocks, Marx gives the best argument of the lot. This is the old, even more hairy Marx. And he says that it's not true that you only want money for the purpose of immediately employing it again to purchase another product. That's, that's say. Because Marx pointed out there are some producers who aren't motivated by consumption but by accumulation. We call them capitalists. Okay? Effectively, say's model is a model of capitalism without capitalists. 
Now, of course, the cat was evicted. Yes, of course, they enjoy their large yachts, etc., etc. I'm not going to argue that uh, Alexi Dai, who owns Oracle, Larry, somebody rather, can't think of his last name. Apparently, he's always trying to get a big yacht and Bill Gates. So they, yes, they do consume, no doubt about that. But the ultimate objective is accumulation of wealth. You measure yourself not by how many yachts you've got, but by how many billions you're worth. And they will withdraw from the markets if they think they can't turn the commodities they might produce into money profits. The objective is to make a monetary profit. And they do seek to conceal the money they've got. All those things are quite bizarre arguments that say put forward, but they're accepted by economists, neoclassical economists, who are the real inheritors of Say's thought. So demand, they don't, they don't demand merchandise for the merchandise, they demand more money for their money. Fundamentally, that's Marx's point. So what you've got in Say's law is a model of simple commodity production, but not of capitalism. So Marx actually worked this out in his writing what he called the rough draft of capital, the Grundrisse. I'm sure I've mispronounced that. But the Grundrisse, the rough draft, which he wrote in 1857 because he thought a major crisis was coming along. So he went back and reread all the classics. Uh, I highly recommend reading that tome. Who gets that particular one about the eighth dick? You'll hate me. Okay, but it's uh, it really is Mark sitting down on his carbuncles and his boils in the uh, British Museum Library, reading through Ricardo again, reading Smith again, reading Say again, reading Bastiat, reading all the various sources that he had read himself from 1844 on, to get ready to write capital. And here he's talking about this argument from Say, and he's saying, okay, if you're looking at exchange the way Say does, you can exchange a commodity for money, and with the money you buy another commodity. And he says, money exchange is mediated between the two. Now, notice the language here is what you might call dialectical. He's putting opposites against each other. So dialectical logic. Have you heard of the dialectics before? A bit? Okay. I'll talk a bit more in detail about that later. Uh, but he's going from one verse to the other. So you start with a commodity, you get to another commodity. You've got double <coughs> antithetical aspect, the living unity. And he says when you have circulation, one commodity exchanges for another, and money's just an intermediary. So he's saying this is the world that Say is talking about. And that particular world is balanced. He said, in that particular world of simple commodity production, the balance of, say, talks about applies. But he said, there's a second circuit which is unbalanced. He said, the second moment, not of commodity exchanges for money and money for commodity, but money exchanges for commodity and commodity for money. The saying as well as there are many people who have a particular commodity, which they sell, get money for it, and use that to buy another commodity, there are equally important people in the system who start with money, buy commodities with them, produce other commodities using those commodities, and then try to sell them for more money. And he says, rather than money just being a medium, it's the aim of circulation. Okay, so the first circuit, money is just a medium. You can therefore ignore it as the neoclassicals do. But he said, in the second circuit, you're trying to get more money. The objective of this particular circuit is to get more money. So it's the first one he's called commodity for money for money for commodity. That's basic commodity exchange, so the sales law stuff applies. But he said the other money for commodity for commodity for money, sales law doesn't apply there. And he says in the former case, money is just a means to obtain a commodity, and the commodity is the aim. In the second case, the commodity is just a means to obtain more money. What you're trying to do in the second circuit is get more money. And in the first circuit, yes, the, the balance argument that say may make sense. You're exchanging one commodity for another. The value in dollars of one commodity is the value of the other commodity. Um, and the only difference that arises is a qualitative one. You might sell your labour and you get bread. Okay. Your labour's worth nothing to you, the bread's worth a lot. So you're getting a gain in your own personal utility. Um, so this would be the idea that so what's the, the person who's selling A and buying B prefers B to A. Reverse applies for the other, other person, so there is a balance there. But it doesn't make sense in the second circuit, because if you start with a certain amount of money, then the only way it makes sense is to end up with more money in the end. If you're going to try to go from M to M plus. This is how Marx puts it. He says, in the first one, 
Um, to exchange commodity for commodity makes sense, because even though equivalent in price, they're qualitatively different, and what you're trying to do is get qualitative satisfaction. So Marx admits that argument makes sense for pure commodity exchange. But he says that in the contrast, if you're exchanging money for money, it doesn't make any sense unless there's a quantitative difference. And that's the capitalist circuit. So he says in the first case of buying in order to sell, the motive is profit. You'll have to qualitative difference between, there is no qualitative difference between X amount of money and X, X squared amount of money. There's just more money in the second case. So he said, um, you can come to grief. Okay, you may actually wish to exchange money for more money, but things can go wrong. You can make a loss. So this particular circuit is far more dangerous in that sense than the first circuit. Now, if you're looking at barter, which is the neoclassical vision, again, where you've got a set of commodities and you want to flog them to get a different set of commodities, then money is just an intermediary just for making barter easier. But again, Marx's case was that money is essential to understanding capitalism. It's not just a measure or the medium it's the, end, it's the end object. You're trying to accumulate more money. So the desire to accumulate is what money fulfills. And that's the role that you notice what Say said, that you do, you do, not, you do not seek to consume money or to conceal it. But you are certainly trying to cons conceal or to accumulate money in a capitalist system. So again, Marx's language is quite convoluted. Anybody who reads from the Grand is going to find page after page of arguments like this. But the wisdom is very, very deep. And so what he's arguing here is because money plays the role of accumulation, and that role can have successes as well as failures, you have to look at that role. You can't analyse capitalism while ignoring the role of accumulation of money. So he said, one part is exchange. If you look at this, the exchange of commodities for money to get other commodities, then that's generally going to be balanced. So if you consume the revenue, uh, you can say demand is equal to its own supply. Now that's very much a, a sales law statement by Marx. And he said, all you've got there is a metamorphosis from one form of a commodity to another, from linen to money to wheat, for example. And in um, volume one of Capital, he goes on ad nauseum with the whole argument about it going from one commodity, linen, to another one, I think normally wheat, as he has in that particular example there. That's balanced. If you said the second is necessarily not balanced, if you're trying to get a surplus, you're going to get more money coming out of it. So he said CMC starts with one commodity, finishes with another, and consumption or utility, his value, his, his term for it, is the object of what you're doing. But the second, MCM plus, commences with money and ends with money. So its goal is to end up with more money than you started with. So Say's law is wrong from first principles. Capitalism is not just simple commodity exchange, which is what Say's law applies to. It's a capitalist system where you're trying to accumulate wealth. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not being critical of capitalism for saying that nasty individual wish to accumulate. I'm saying it's the system we live in. If you're going to analyse capitalism, then you've got to analyse that behaviour as well as commodity exchange. And if you look, therefore, at the sum, what aggregate demand is in the overall system, it's the sum of what's going on in the CMC circuit plus what's going on in the MCM plus circuit. Those two sources of demand are therefore the sources of demand for labour, indirect sources of demand for labour. You'll have workers employed in what you can call a CMC circuit, workers employed in what you can call an MCM plus circuit, and the sum of that will give you your aggregate level of demand for labour. And they can be deficient. If capitalist expectations of profit decline, investment doesn't occur, then the workers you have employed in that area don't have a job, and unemployment, involuntary unemployment can result. So all the possibilities of the macroeconomic data that we focus upon in macroeconomic theory comes from that second circuit, which is neglected by, say, and by the neoclassicals that come after it. And all the complexity of the system arise from that as well. It's quite easy to explain a system of simple commodity exchange. It ain't capitalism. Capitalism is a lot more complex beast. So the neoclassicals 
all the failures they, they make, being unable to understand why capitalism is cyclical to begin with, being unable to appreciate why financial crises occur, I think you can take them right back to this foundation they've got in Jean-Baptiste Say and that way of thinking of seeing capitalism as fundamentally simple commodity exchange, not a capitalist system. And here's Marx's very heavy-handed way of stating it. And I think this is uh, there is a surplus value. It ne it's never be forgotten that what matters is not immediate use value, but exchange value and the expansion of surplus value. And that's the driving motors of capitalist production. And it's a pretty conception that abstracts, in order to reason away the contradictions, abstracts from its very basis and depicts it as a production danger of direct satisfaction for the consumption of the producers. That still describes what neoclassicals are doing today. So he's saying, they're after the expansion of surface value. That MCM plus circuit is what matters. And use values aren't the objective. Utility is not the objective. The objective is accumulating wealth. And I love some of Marx's expressions here. The boundless greed after riches, this passenger chase after exchange value, is common to the capitalist and the miser. But the miser is merely a capitalist gone mad. The capitalist is a rational miser. Beautiful language. So that's Marx's vision, and Marx's vision of what capitalism is about at that level is fundamentally accurate. It's what Say leaves out that's wrong. And what I might do is take a bit of a break here. It's a bit of uh, my voice is dying a bit. Let's take a bit of a break, come back, and uh, keep on rolling in the second half. <laughs>